What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is part two of a three part video in which I break down my dynasty running back rankings. The first video dropped like four days ago on Wednesday. Uh, had my top 10 running backs. Today's video is RB 11 through 20. Let's do it. <laughs> going to start at RB20, and my RB20 in Dynasty is J.K. Dobbins. He's currently being drafted in Dynasty Leagues as RB14, so I'm a little bit lower than consensus on J.K. Dobbins. And basically that comes down to, I believe that J.K. Dobbins is more role player than centerpiece. And in order to, you know, kind of make good on RB14 value, you know, high-end RB2, low-end RB1 production with you know, potential for more. He would need to be more of a centerpiece to this Ravens offense where I believe he's just kind of a role player, a Tevin Coleman type role player. I don't know, Chase Edmonds type role player, something like that. And basically that opinion is derived from a couple of things. And the first one would be his rushing efficiency profile. And we know that J.K. Dobbins has been a really efficient runner when he's played so far in the NFL, which, you know, he was hurt last year coming off the torn ACL, which was essentially just 2020. Um, he averaged 5.88 yards per carry, which is great, even relative to the, to the other backs on the Ravens. He was really good. He averaged 1.14 yards per carry, greater than the collective other running backs in Baltimore. That's in the 88th percentile, so really good there. Going back to 2019, his last season at Ohio State, he averaged 6.65 yards per carry. Also great. So why am I sort of lower on him given that like plus efficiency? First of all, I think he's really good like in the open field. He's a great like big play runner. But as far as like down to down consistency, like producing positive outcomes on a regular basis, he's been below average throughout his career. In 2020 with the Ravens, despite being super efficient, he was not very consistent on a play to play basis. I have this metric called relative success rate which looks at how often is a player gaining a requisite amount of yards given down in distance. Not necessarily just like first down rate, but if it's, you know, first and 10, you need to get like at least five yards in order for it to be counted as a success per this metric. And then it's relative because it's relative to what his teammates are doing. So given the context of the offense that he's operating in and relative to the box counts that he's seeing compared to the box counts that the other guys in the team are seeing. So... Given all of those factors, J.K. Dobbins in 2020 succeeded on his carries, produced a positive outcome on his carries negative 1.1% of the time compared to the other backs on the team. That's in the 46th percentile, which means given his very high efficiency and his relatively low down-to-down -down consistency, he was one of the more volatile backs in the entire league on a per carry basis. Among backs with at least 100 carries, he was actually sixth highest in volatility rating, which is a metric kind of just derived between box adjusted efficiency rating, which is like overall team relative efficiency and relative success rate. So the relationship between the two of those describes a player's volatility on a per carry basis. J.K. Dobbins was the sixth highest in the league among high volume backs in 2020. He was the same player at Ohio State. His overall efficiency at Ohio State was a little bit less impressive, 6.65 yards per carry, but that was only 0.12 yards per carry greater than what, what other Ohio State backs were producing, which is just in the 33rd percentile for like eventual NFL running back. So he was efficient and more efficient than the, than the other backs at Ohio State, but not so efficient compared to them that it was like impressive in the context of historical running back prospects. It was unimpressive in that context. And he was even less impressive on like a per carry down to down basis with a negative 2.5% relative success rate in the 24th percentile for running back prospects, giving him the 18th highest volatility rating among all high volume backs in the country 2019. And so, you know, a lot of his production then, given the, the like low consistency on a play to play basis has come from these big runs that he's been able to produce in 2020, his breakaway conversion rate, which describes how often is he turning a 10 yard run into a 20 yard run. So he's already, he's already succeeded on this carry. He's already, he's already reached the open field. How often is he converting that into a longer gain, you know, showing explosive ability in the open field? He's great at that. 
In 2020, his breakaway conversion rate was in the 87th percentile. Accordingly, his yards per carry plus, like his team relative yards per carry, was in the 88th percentile that season. So great in the open field, great overall efficiency compared to his teammates. In 2019, his breakaway conversion rate in the 75th percentile, his yards per carry plus a little bit higher than his teammates, not by much, but his box adjusted efficiency rating, which I touched on a little bit. I'll explain it here because I'm going to go over it again, describes not down to down consistency, but just overall efficiency relative to what other players in the same offense and environment are producing given the box counts that you're seeing. And so it's basically bird's eye view efficiency compared to your teammates relative to the box counts that you're seeing versus theirs. That was in the 58th percentile for him in 2019 to go along with a high breakaway conversion rate. In 2018, he did not have a high breakaway conversion rate, 31st percentile, and his, you know, box adjusted efficiency rating was just in the 27th percentile. So we've seen, you know, year over year, his efficiency has been very tied to what he's producing in the open field, which isn't necessarily bad, but production in the open field is not like predictive. Long runs are very fluky. They're hard to count on. What happens for J.K. Dobbins when they don't come? If he has a season where he's just like, you know, gets tripped up in the open field a couple times, isn't able to extend those those secondary entering runs deeper into the secondary, what does his efficiency look like? We can't operate going forward as if he's just like a six yard per carry guy and will always be. He's been a six yard per carry guy despite succeeding on a low percentage of his runs because he's so great in the open field. And this Ravens offense is conducive to him getting to the open field where he can shine there. But those things are fluky. If he's not able to do that, if he's not able to sustain that for an entire season, what happens to his production? What happens to his efficiency? It goes way down because he's not a guy who's creating on his own outside the context of big plays in the open field. Add to that that the Ravens had the third lowest running back target share in 2021. There's this like reputation that running quarterbacks just don't throw to running backs. I don't know that that's always true. It's true in Baltimore. I don't know if it's because Lamar Jackson is a runner or if he just doesn't check down, but he just doesn't check down. The Ravens were not throwing to running backs last season. They weren't throwing to running backs in 2020. J.K. Dobbins is also five foot nine, 209 pounds. He's not a big dude. Those guys often don't get high volume in the NFL. We saw him as a rookie not get super high volume. He split time with Gus Edwards. Who knows what that sort of like split workload kind of distribution looks like going forward. But like, what's the path to RB1, you know, type numbers here to even like high end RB2 numbers here? I don't see it. He's not going to catch a lot of passes. It's hard to trust his efficiency, given that it's dependent on like fluky long runs. That's why I'm lower on J.K. Dobbins than consensus in Dynasty. My RB19 is Antonio Gibson, who has been fine, even good in some areas so far in his career. And it feels like there's like this untapped potential for more. I'm just scared that it never happens. And if we kind of look at these same rushing efficiency metrics, he was 66th last season, 66th percentile, I should say, in box adjusted efficiency rating. So pretty efficient on a per carry basis, but his relative success rate, so like per carry consistency, just in the 45th percentile, which resulted in him having the fifth highest volatility rating among high volume backs. The year before, he was 81st percentile in box adjusted efficiency rating, 55th percentile in relative success rate. So while he was better there, that's really the same disparity. And he had the eighth highest volatility rating in 2020. And so I think it kind of makes sense. Like he has athletic juice. He's he's a good, efficient runner overall, but he's not reliable down to down. He lacks some nuance as a runner. You know, he's got a wide receiver background. That makes sense in the context of like his historical profile that he's producing efficiently while not producing consistently. And if you look at this Washington offense, like in fantasy, we want number one, touchdown opportunities for our running backs. And number two, we want targets. And Antonio Gibson is six feet tall and 228 pounds and was a wide receiver in college. Like if anybody is like hypothetically well suited to like secure and make the most of touchdown opportunities and targets, it's Antonio Gibson. Like he's, he's got a David Johnson type profile in that way. But A, the Washington offense is bad. In 2021 and 2020, they finished 24th and 25th in points. In 2021 and 2020, they finished 21st and 30th in yards. There are not a lot of touchdown opportunities available here. And they just re-signed J.D. McKissick. He was the main pass catching back last year. They seem to not want to throw to Gibson. And so despite him being like well-suited to scoring touchdowns, he's on an offense that's not conducive to that. And despite him being well-suited to catch the ball a lot, he's on an offense that seems to not want him in that role. And they just added Brian Robinson, who complements the things that Antonio Gibson does well in like providing a lot of this like athletic juice with reliable down-to-down consistency. Like this is what Brian Robinson does well, and this is what Antonio Gibson does well. And so 
it's tough to view Antonio Gibson now as like the absolute go-to guy on like early downs even because now they have Brian Robinson who's just like a more consistent, more reliable candidate to do those things because Antonio Gibson lacks some nuance as a pure runner given that he hasn't played the position for that long. And so we want touchdown opportunities. He's not getting them in this offense. We want targets. He's not really getting them in this offense. And so what's left is like early down work where he's been good, but now they added Brian Robinson. I think this is going to be a messy committee and Antonio Gibson is like talented enough to justify trusting in fantasy despite that, but it's hard to trust him. Where Where is he going right now? He's being drafted as the RB17. I have him at RB19, so I'm a little bit lower than him. Just becoming harder and harder to trust this guy. Like he was found money in the second round of rookie drafts back in what, 2019 or, or 2020 um, for like savvy people who were paying attention to the right details. But like you got good return on your investment. Like it's tough to expect more at this point. My RB18 is Aaron Jones. And kind of the situation for him is like, hypothetically opportunity for him is like looking juicy this season. Like Devontae Adams is gone, but we're in a downward trend with Aaron Jones's effectiveness as a runner in his career. And in 2017, I'll just go through like his his efficiency numbers since he entered the league. In 2017, his box adjusted efficiency rating was 160%, which basically means given the box counts that he's seeing, the average carry for Aaron Jones back in 2017 was worth 160% the output of the average carry for all other non, non-Aaron non Jones running backs in Green Bay, like the collective other backs. He was producing at a 160% rate of what they were producing on a per carry basis. That's obviously elite. His relative success rate that year was almost 6%. So he was succeeding on almost 6% greater of his carries than the collective other backs in Green Bay. Great. The next season, 145% box adjusted efficiency rating, 12% relative success rate. Elite. 2019, 123% box adjusted efficiency rating, but now a negative 0.2% relative success rate. So now he's entered into sort of like J.K. Dobbins, Antonio Gibson territory where he's producing efficiently because he has this juice. He's he's a dynamic, explosive player, but he's no longer like navigating the line of scrimmage and creating positive outcomes at a higher rate than his teammates are. And so then 2020, 128% box adjusted efficiency rating, still producing efficiently, very well relative to his teammates, but relative success rate. He's now producing positive outcomes 1% less often than his teammates are. And then last year, the worst marks of his career in both of those categories, his box adjusted efficiency rating was only 114%. I say only, that's still good, but it's it's the lowest we've seen. And his relative success rate was actively bad. Negative 5%. He's now, he's gone from succeeding on more than what, on 12% more of his carries in 2018 than the rest of his teammates to now succeeding on 5% less of his carries in 2021. He's going to be, what, 27 years old this year. He's also seen a severe dip in, like, goal line work. In 2019 and 2020, when he was, like, a touchdown machine, he saw 19 and 20 carries, respectively, in those seasons from the 10-yard line and in. Last year, he saw 15, which is still decent, but A.J. Dillon, the other back there, saw two goal line carries, or 10 and in carries. I'm calling them goal line carries, but whatever. A.J. Dillon saw two goal line carries in 2020 and 21 goal line carries in 2021. So it sort of flipped where like Aaron Jones has been the preferred option at the goal line within the 10-yard line the past couple years to now it's A.J. Dillon. What happens if he stops getting that heavy goal line work and it's a full transition to A.J. Dillon? Now we no longer have this touchdown upside for Aaron Jones. And there's this speculation that he could see a lot of receiving work with Devontae Adams gone. But his target shares the last couple of years have been 12.4%, 13.7%, 11.9%. Those are right around the like 65th percentiles for NFL running backs. Good, but not elite. He needs a big jump to make up for a potential loss in touchdown opportunities and a consistent dip in per carry efficiency. And it's hard to project like a big jump in a category like that this deep into a player's career. There's not a lot of unknown in Aaron Jones' skill set right now. He pretty much is what he is as a pass catcher. He's declining a little bit as a runner. It's hard to make the case that like he's suddenly going to be this super involved, you know, heavily targeted running back when I think he's a really good receiver, but he hasn't been heavily involved to such a severe degree in the past. It's hard to project that going forward. And so I like Aaron Jones this year. I just don't think... I like him as much as a lot of other people do. Where's he going in Dynasty right now? He's going as the RB20, so I guess I have him a little bit higher. I'm in on his, like, short-term upside, but I think this downward trend we're seeing with his per carry efficiency, I would not bet on him being around much longer. The dead cap situation, he's a cut candidate after this season. You know, I'm kind of in on him this year. 
but not long-term at all for Aaron Jones. Another guy who that's sort of true for is my RB17 is Derrick Henry, and the case against him is easy. Um, it's really just about risk aversion and about wanting to get out early and make the most of the value on your fantasy team. Derrick Henry, I made a video about him a couple, a couple months ago now, I guess, but he had, according to Box Adjusted Efficiency Rating and Relative Success Rate, he had the least effective season of his career on a per-carry touch basis last season easily. Like, at the peak of his powers, in 2018, he had a 166% box adjusted efficiency rating. He was consistently above 130% for the four years between 2017 and 2020. His relative success rate was consistently above 5%. It was above 13% in three of those four years. Going back to his rookie season in 2016, playing behind DeMarco Murray, his box adjusted efficiency rating was 104.3%. So he was producing slightly more on a per carry basis than the other guys in the team were. And his relative success rate was 1.5% percent that season so slightly more consistent than them then he had that long stretch that four-year stretch of elite play and then last year his box adjusted efficiency rating dipped to 100.1 percent which means a 100 percent box adjusted efficiency rating means you're producing at exactly the per carry output of your teammates 100 percent of their per carry output he was at 100.1 percent so like elite pure runner king henry was doing exactly what the other running backs for Tennessee were doing on a per carry basis, while his relative success rate was negative 1.4%. So he became a little bit of a volatile runner last year. He still had the big plays and things like that, but producing positive outcomes on a consistent basis, he no longer was doing for the first time in his career. And then he broke his foot, missed the rest of the season. He's now a 28-year-old running back. He's nearly 250 pounds. We don't see big guys age well very often. He's coming off a broken foot and a least effective season of his career. High-end volume field production is obviously still in play. He was not as effective as he has been on a per carry basis last year, and he was still the RB1 on a points per game basis before he went down and down with injury. So it's completely in play that he could still have some sort of like volume field season where he's averaging, you know, low yards per carry, not effective on a per touch basis, but just being absolutely fed, scoring touchdowns, things like that anyway. But the Titans, it's hard to believe that their offense is going to be bet, you know, at least as good as it has been. They lost A.J. Brown, replaced him with Traylon Burks, who like we're optimistic about, but he's probably not A.J. Brown. And the other possibility for Derrick Henry is that he just completely falls off. Like we've seen running backs before just completely not have it anymore. Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell. Derrick Henry gave us like a hint that that might happen. And so I'm out. I'm, I'm getting out early on Derrick Henry. I'm not in on him on in redraft. I'm, I'm getting out in Dynasty. I think you've got to fade Derrick Henry. There's a chance that he's just done. My RB16 is Kenneth Walker. I've spent a lot of time talking about Kenneth Walker on this channel. I made a video completely dedicated to like post-draft Kenneth Walker a couple weeks ago. So I will defer mostly to that. But there's like a large range of like long and short-term outcomes for him. And this feels like an appropriate spot, RB16. I think it's actually exactly where he's being drafted in Dynasty right now. But I'm... A, not confident in him ever being more than a basic dump-off option in the passing game, given what we saw from him in college. He's pretty small, but I do think he's just big enough to handle a large workload in college. And if he gets that, I believe he'll make the most of his opportunities, because I think he's an excellent pure runner. I just don't think the most of his opportunities in Seattle is much. Like, even if he makes the most of his opportunities in Seattle, Seattle is not a situation right now that's conducive to that being very much in fantasy. And there's also the short-term problem of, like, Rashad Penny's still on the team right now. He was excellent last year, and Pete Carroll has shown a historical deference to whoever is playing the best. Like, Rashad Penny was a first-round pick, and he himself was, you know, kind of put on the bench as a rookie by a former seventh-round pick in Chris Carson who just played better. What if Rashad Penny just plays better this year? Kenneth Walker would be on the bench. Seattle also has a terrible offense. They're going to be maybe last in pace of play. Kenneth Walker just has to be, like, historically efficient on his carries, even if he does get the bulk of them in 2022. So it just feels like a weighted out year. Like, you don't need to invest in Kenneth Walker right now. I would just wait. His value might go up, but Seattle is still likely to be terrible. I don't know. I just don't see those things converging this season to be good for him. And even going forward, he's not a great pass catcher, probably. He's not that big. Like, the, you know, Pete Carroll's got some backwards offensive system. Like, he just landed in a spot that I don't think is very good. It's better long term than in his short term, but especially in the short term, I'm not very optimistic here. My RB15 of Dynasty is Nick Chubb, who I am slightly hesitant on. I think he's being drafted higher than this. Yeah, he's being taken as the RB11 right now. But I'm slightly hesitant based on like some inconclusive signs on his decline that I've seen. Basically, 
in these these advanced rushing efficiency metrics that I look at, his box adjusted efficiency rating, his rookie year, almost 160%, then 129, then 123. This last year went down to 111. And so he's still effective, just like Aaron Jones was, but he's getting less effective each season. Same thing in relative success rate. His rookie year, 10% relative success rate, succeeding on 10% more of his carries than the other backs on the team. The last two seasons, negative 2%. So severe dip that also coincided with Kareem Hunt joining the team so there was you know like an increase in talent for the other backs so you know that's a little bit understandable but last year Kareem Hunt was very ineffective and Nick Chubb dipped to negative four percent relative success rate so he had the worst season of his career on a per carry basis last se- last season relative to the offensive environment that he's playing in and it kind of feels like he's going to be like a low-end RB1 forever Until he's not. Like, he's 26 years old. He suffered severe injuries at Georgia. He's declined in efficiency and per carry, like, consistency every season of his career. He doesn't catch passes. Two down backs are especially dependent on, like, game script and overall offensive efficiency to provide them with, like, early down and goal line opportunities. And, you know, if Deshaun Watson was the quarterback all season, like, this should be a great offense. But it's looking more and more like that's not going to be the case. He might not even have Baker Mayfield anymore. We might be going with Jacoby Brissett all season. Like, things are unraveling with this offensive situation in Cleveland. And there's a chance that Nick Chubb is also slowly losing his ability to maximize his situation. I believe he's still a good player for the time being, but I think the time is not long when he's going to, like, no longer be effective enough to maximize his situation, especially given that the situation looks like it's not going to be very good. My RB14 in Dynasty is Leonard Fournette, and this is uh, higher than he's currently being drafted. I believe he's currently being drafted as RB21. Um, I talked about the case for Fournette as a value in my Javante Williams video from a couple weeks ago, and it's pretty simple. Basically, he's got a full skill set. He's still an effective runner. Um, He's still an effective pass catcher. He's in a good offensive situation. He was productive last year, very productive. He was like the RB4 on a per-game basis. And he's not significantly older than like Austin Eckler and Alvin Kamara types who are being taken far earlier than him in dynasty drafts right now. The two risks for Leonard Fournette are that, number one, Rashad White, the rookie running back out of Arizona State, cuts into his workload a little bit. I think Rashad White is super talented. I think he's got like David Johnson, Alvin Kamara type upside. I don't know that he ever reaches that, but I think that's his ceiling. And so Rashad White could prove to just have more juice. Rashad White could be, you know, a a threat to like a lot of the passing game usage for Fournette. Who knows what that situation looks like? And the other risk is that Fournette just falls off. Like he has an, he has a little bit of a history of like up and down play. He's like super efficient one year, super, you know, sluggish the next year. I would anticipate him being motivated and effective this season, but there's a risk given his history that like we just can't trust him, which is why you can't put him up in the range of like a Joe Mixon, Austin Eckler, Alvin Kamara in Dynasty, but I do think he's going too late right now. He's a great win now asset. I really like Leonard Fournette, at least in 2021. He could be a league winning type value at RB20 prices. My RB13 in Dynasty is Cam Akers and I hypothetically like Cam Akers, but the question I have is just like, what have we actually seen from him at this point? In 2021, obviously, he tore his Achilles, came back, incredible recovery. He was not effective on a per-touch basis at all after coming back from injury, which isn't necessarily his fault, but it's not like we saw him come back and be really good. He was third percentile in both box-adjusted efficiency rating and relative success rate, just absolutely abysmal on a per-carry basis. That's including playoff numbers. So after, you know, the regular season, just really bad last year. And yeah, I get it. He, he was coming off the Achilles. I'm not holding that against him necessarily. It's just not something that we can look at as a positive. And then in 2020, you know, he was that was his rookie year. He was 55th percentile in box adjusted efficiency rating, so an above average per carry runner, but ninth percentile in relative success rate. Like very incredibly volatile on a per carry basis, not producing positive outcomes relative to the offensive environment he's in, he's operating in consistently at all. And that tracks with what he was doing in college. Going back to 2018 at Florida State, 72nd percentile in box adjusted efficiency rating, 28th percentile in relative success rate. So he was playing on a team at Florida State that had like a terrible offensive line, just absolutely terrible. And I think a little bit of that is like, he's trying to make something out of nothing. Like there are guys in the backfield every time he's touching the ball, he's juking his way to, you know, even positive yardage each time. But he was taking a lot of negative plays and a lot of negative outcomes, even relative to the other backs at Florida State. And then the next season, it's almost like he corrected that. His success rate that year 
went up to the 65th percentile, while his overall efficiency, box adjusted efficiency rating, went to the 26th percentile. So he like flip flopped. It's like he figured out like, okay, he's playing within himself now. He's no longer like trying to do too much, and so he's producing positive outcomes at a high rate. But his overall efficiency suffered as a result of like not you know shooting for the moon on every play. And so there was like a feeling out process in college where he kind of figured it out but never was able to put it all together in one season. We saw the same sort of like growing pains in his rookie year. And then last year he tore his Achilles. Like, I'm not sure we've seen enough from Cam Akers to say like, yes, I can be confident in him going forward as like a full package, full skill set RB1. And there's like a lot of reasons, lots of excuses for his like high volatility and his poor efficiency. But at what point do we just like take what he's doing at face value? I understand that there's like built in excuses and reasons for these things in every season of his career. But like, how long do we take these excuses? I'm a little like hesitant to even call them excuses because I feel like they're legitimate reasons, but it's hard to like look at what he could hypothetically be for so many years in a row without seeing it, even though there's like legitimate reasons for him not reaching that potential. It's like, what reason do we have to actually believe that that is his potential? All of that being said, he's only going to be 23 when the season starts. He's still really young. Another, another downside is that the Rams throw less to running backs, at least they did last year in their first year with Matthew Stafford, less than any other team in the league by far. Target share to running backs was 12%. The next lowest team was 14.8% target share to running backs. So incredibly low target share to running backs. I think Cam Akers is a good receiver. I don't know that we'll see him used that way, which is another downside for his fantasy production. I'm just kind of okay waiting this year out to see if he's healthy, to see if he's effective, to see if he's able to put it all together, and acquiring him next offseason even at increased prices. Like, I'm I'm totally fine with that. My RB12 is Saquon Barkley, and he's another guy. It's just really hard to know what to do with Saquon. Kind of similar to Cam Akers, honestly. He's been, like, efficient at times, incredibly volatile on a per-carry basis throughout his career, 93rd percentile box-adjusted efficiency rating as a rookie, 59th percentile relative success rate, 79th percentile, and 40th percentile the next season. Like, huge disparities in what he's doing, like, overall on a per-carry basis and what he's doing on, like, a down-to-down consistency basis. And then 2020, he was hurt first and fourth percentile in those metrics, and then last year, 36th and 27th percentile in those metrics. Even going back to college, like, his, his college yards per carry plus, like, what, we don't have box count data for his time in college, but... His yards per carry plus, what is he doing on a per carry basis relative to his teammates? He averages 0.1 yards per carry greater than the other guys at Penn State. Like, Saquon was the greatest running back prospect of all time, like, untouchable RB1 in that class. He was barely more efficient than the other running backs at Penn State. His chunk rate plus, which is sort of like a proxy, a worse proxy for relative success rate, just how often is he reaching the secondary on his runs? How often is he ripping off 10-yard runs? He was doing that at 1% less often than the other Penn State running backs. Those numbers are in the 32nd and 26th percentiles compared to other NFL running back prospects. Like, he was not an impressive runner from an efficiency standpoint in college, and he hasn't been impressive from an efficiency standpoint in the NFL for the last two seasons, and he's never been impressive from like a down-to-down consistency basis. He's not a good pure runner. He's extremely volatile on a per-carry basis, and his stretches of good play, going back to like his, his college days, his rookie year, his second year, those stretches of like good, efficient play have been fueled by athletic ability that enables him to like produce these big plays, rip off these big runs, and he's been hurt consistently the past couple years. What if that athletic ability just like isn't there anymore or isn't there to the same degree? When you're like an extremely elite athlete, and that's how you're how you're gaining an edge if you fall off there a little bit he's not a guy who has like this like super good instincts and nuance in navigating the line of scrimmage like he's not a jordan howard frank gore type pure runner surviving and thriving despite sub athleticism like he hasn't learned how to do that and so if he's declined athletically like what are we hoping for here i'm a little optimistic about his passing usage you know they've got uh brian dable um, former bills uh, offensive coordinator um, should be, you know, a much more like modern, sensible offensive system this year in New York. But Saquon is not a player that's going to age gracefully. He's kind of like Christian McCaffrey in that, like, we haven't seen him be effective and healthy for a couple of years now, and it's becoming harder and harder to trust that. He's got upside, but it's very scary. I think the upside is enough to justify putting him at RB12, but the downside is too great to justify putting him, like, in the top 10 running backs. My RB11 is Alvin Kamara. And he's interesting because throughout his career, he's been like this, you know, kind of like 1A 
as a pure like two down runner and then like an elite pass catcher and that role sort of like completely flipped in 2021 targets per game in his career starting in 2017 6.3 7.0 6.9 7.1 last year 5.2 carries per game starting in 2017 7.5 and then up to 12.9 12.2 12.5 and then last year 18.5 so he went from like high receiving usage and relatively low rushing volume flipped where he was like decently high in targets you know i think he had like 67 last year or something like that but like he had like 240 carries last year in like 14 or 13 games or whatever it was and i think those things are those are good it proved that he could function in an, in another role like there were questions early on in his career about like could he handle a workload he hadn't done it in college i think that was nonsense but he absolutely smashed those concerns this last year like he was just a pure two down runner who was involved in the passing game last year as opposed to being like a space back who never really had like a full two down role he was also very efficient on the ground last year, even with the increased volume. Like, I do think, though, that, like, they probably want to pair Kamara with another back, but they're currently not doing a very good job of finding that guy. Like, they brought Mark Ingram back last year. They got Abram Smith this year as an undrafted free agent who got a lot of guaranteed money, which is important for undrafted free agent running backs. I think Abram Smith could step in and be, like, the 1B to Alvin Kamara. They've had that, uh, you know, a role like that historically. The suspension is mainly the thing that messes this ranking up, though. Like, Kamara's right there with Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, Austin Eckler, as far as, like, what we should expect from him going forward, given his, like, you know, production lately, given his age. Like, I think we should look at him similarly to those guys, and I had all of those guys in my top 10 running backs, but who knows what happens with this suspension. It's hard to just, like, value him similarly to Dalvin Cook, for instance, when we know that Dalvin Cook is going to be available for the first part of the season. We have we don't really know yet what's going to happen with Alvin Kamara. So he's my RB11. Really like Alvin Kamara. Would be really excited about having him on my, on my dynasty team. You just can't take him above like a Dalvin Cook or Joe Mixon type given the suspension this year. So that's my top 20 running backs or my top, what, 11 through 20 running backs. Thanks for checking it out. Leave a comment, like, subscribe, hit me up on Twitter, follow me on Twitter, DM me. Next video will be top 30 RB21 through 30 to wrap up the top 30 running backs. I don't know. Have a good week. Deuces.